and I think you'll in, uh, enjoy the conversation today. Um, let me just run through their bios briefly. Um, Larry Lang is board president of the Los Altos History Museum Association. He currently chairs the Los Altos Historical Commission, a barrier resident since 1991. He moved from New Jersey to join Cisco. His current work focuses on tech startups. He enjoys painting, sailing, and traveling with his family, including visiting historical sites. He holds engineering degrees from Stanford and Duke. Elizabeth Ward became the executive director of the Los Altos History Museum in 2017. She grew up in Southern California and spent summers with family in Iceland. She holds a master's degree in anthropology with a concentration in museum studies and a PhD in Scandinavian languages and literature from UC Berkeley. Before coming to the Los Altos History Museum, she worked at the Smithsonian Institution's Natural History Museum and at Pacific Lutheran University. Uh, please join me in uh, welcoming Larry and Elizabeth this morning. Lots of air claps. Uh, <laughs> welcome, you guys. Thank you so much for uh, for offering this and for for joining us. Um, so let's uh, let's start off this morning. Um, maybe Larry, you could walk us through a brief overview of the history museum, how we got here, um, you know, and we'll get to where we're going maybe later on in the program. Yeah, sure. I'll give you a, a bit of background uh, just because there's some entities involved it might be helpful for people to understand that. So the, the the history of the history museum goes back to uh, shortly after the the city was founded. Uh, a couple of years later in 1954, the city bought the land that is currently the Civic Center uh, from um, uh, J. Gilbert Smith. Uh, he and his wife maintained a right to use the residence that they had there uh, up until uh, Margaret died in 1973, at which point the city asked the Historical Commission at the time to begin looking into turning it into a museum. Uh, they were real interested in sort of maintaining it originally mostly as a museum about the agricultural past of the area. Uh, so for a number of years, um, over 10 years, the, the group there used the Smith House as sort of a museum with some exhibits downstairs. Of course, as a private home. It wasn't ideal museum space, but that's how it all got started. Uh, one little fact that I enjoy about it was that the group of people who were doing that at the time were called an auxiliary, was the, the Smith House Auxiliary. Uh, that has changed now. It's now the association of the Los Angeles History Museum is a corporation, a 501c3. And that became important in the, the uh, late 80s when people began to get a little bit more ambitious and decided it would be cool to build an actual museum building. And so fundraising went on. Uh, no doubt there were the occasional debates, maybe even arguments, who knows. Uh, but uh, over the, the succeeding 10 years, they managed to gather $3.5 million and build the the, uh, the current museum uh, sort of designed to look like a, a very beautiful barn, uh, reminiscent of the, the, the area. And that was actually gifted to the city in 2002. So... Um, uh, and it continues in that way. We have a contract, we meaning the association has a contract with the city, uh, which owns the museum, but we're essentially contracted to run it, do the exhibits, all of those sorts of things. So it's it's turned out to be, a, I think, a, a good example of a, a, an excellent uh, public-private partnership in terms of getting things done. I actually had a conver conversation yesterday with Gabe, the city manager, who talked about in a previous city where he worked, they had the history had a, or the city had, there had a history museum that the city tried to run. It went slowly, not great. And so uh, he proposed and, and worked with interested locals to turn that into more of this kind of arrangement where it was run by an organization of, of interested volunteers and got way better. So I think I think it, it allows for a number of good things in terms of uh, organizing volunteers, making decisions quickly, um, accepting donations, allowing the donors to help steer all that and so forth and, and uh, so forth. So that brings us to today, uh, where another, probably I'd say the second biggest after building the museum uh, set of donations has come together to create the permanent exhibit we're going to be talking about today. Awesome. Thank you. That's, that's super helpful. And, it, you know, I think uh, many of us maybe all of us would agree it's it's one of the best examples of a, um, you know, local city history museum, perhaps on the peninsula, um, maybe maybe even broader than that. So um, so thanks for that overview. Um, so Elizabeth, I, I know uh, you've been running around like crazy and uh, the excitement's been building as we get ready for 
the um, the opening of the new exhibition tomorrow, which is uh, Saturday. And, you know, I'd love for you to take a few minutes just to um, talk about how this exhibition came to be. What was the uh, what was the spark and uh, how did we get to where we are today? Oh, thank you. Thank you, Joe. And thanks, everybody. Good morning. Um, the uh, the building that, that Larry was referring to, that the community came together to build, that opened in 2001 to the public. And as Larry said, it was gifted to the city in 2002. Um, 2001, the, the city, uh, the building, which many of us call the History Museum, but it's actually the whole complex, like right? the J. Gilbert Smith House, the outside grounds, um, and and the uh, and the building itself. So when that was first created, the Gray Barn Building, it was called the Education Center, and um, so that Education Center had on the top floor a permanent exhibition, and um, it had a, a series of small alcoves, and each alcove looked time period. So there was an Ohlone alcove, there was sort of a Mexican alcove, there was a model of uh, Mission Santa Clara, and, and it did, a, it, it had sort of a, it had a oval shape that kind of walked you through history in a chronological order. Um, and, and then it, it's, it culminated to everyone's delight in the train diorama, the 1932 diorama of, of what the city of Los Altos looked like when it was a train stop but before the town even incorporated and wonderful scale model, lots of research and volunteer time had gone into building that. Um, so, and that was really the culmination of the exhibition. It was great, but it, uh, people just tended to leave right after that, even though there was on the back of one wall, there was, there was like, and then Silicon Valley happened, you know, and, and so it, it just always from the beginning of that permanent exhibition. And I think to, to Larry's point about the idea of the J. Gilbert Smith house being about preserving agricultural past, um, there was some way in which the permanent exhibition also very much was like this march of history towards our agricultural period and and then like it's been disappointing since then you know which which i do not think those of us in in this zoom um on, on technology and dealing with the internet would necessarily agree that that uh, things have gone badly since 1932 so um i thought so we really wanted to be able to have a format that would allow us to tell more stories broader stories and um and that's kind of where especially it's it's really remarkable to, to look at someone like nan geshke and we have to really acknowledge her role and her presence in in this entire process she was on the historic commission when some of these early decisions were being made she was part of the fundraising effort to build the the gray barn building um at her and her husband chuck uh, of adobe were were very involved in, in all of those efforts nan was basically the curator she's quite a good historian and a librarian um she was part of the she was basically the curator for the original permanent exhibition and she was the first one to say this isn't working. We need more. We need this needs to be more flexible format. This isn't telling all the stories we want to tell. And so Nan, for at least since 2015, and, and I came in 2017, but she had ad been advocating since at least 2015 to say we need a new permanent exhibition. Um, and, and permanent exhibitions in the museum world almost any museum you go to will have this bifurcation between their permanent exhibition, which is the core of their storytelling. It, it displays a lot of their permanent collection. And then they'll have these changing exhibition galleries. So that's a very normal format in a lot of different museums. Um, and they typically, they're intended to last uh, maybe 15, 20 years. That's a normal life cycle for a permanent exhibition. When I worked at the Smithsonian Natural History Museum, all of the curators were very frustrated that like the history of man exhibit had been up since the 70s, you know, and here we were at 10. So it, it 30, 40 years exhibits really start to get long in the tooth. And if they're up long enough, they become historic themselves. And like, you don't <laughs> want to change it because they're using <laughs> display techniques from, you know, a century ago. So um, yeah, so exhibits, we tend to do these on, on about this uh, time scale. And uh, I think I really just want to applaud um, Nan's uh, initiative at getting this going. And she gave a she she and uh, Ed and Pamela Taft, who also worked at Adobe, gave a lead gift to kind of really get this thing started and uh, and a big commitment from both of them that they would see this project through to the end and to make sure that it had adequate funding. So um, we're, we're very grateful for Nan's leadership. That's great. Thank you so much. And um, 
you know, we we have a, a special treat for you guys today, hoping the Zoom gods, uh, you know, agree with us and allow this to happen. But um, starting tomorrow, you can go to the uh, exhibition in person. And it's it's really cool for those of you who haven't seen it yet, which is probably the majority. Um, great use of technology combined with storytelling and um we we thought about doing an in-person community coalition event, but we decided the the challenges of trying to stream that to other people would be we too difficult. So what we did instead is uh, Larry Barron was gracious enough to help us out with a quick video. It's um you know it's it's very straightforward. There aren't fancy lights and microphones, so bear with us. Um, but we just wanted to give everybody a taste of the new exhibition. So um, this this sneak preview is about five minutes long. And then we'll come back uh, afterwards and talk a little bit more about it. Well, welcome to our, uh, the Geshki Gallery, where we're unveiling a new permanent exhibition here at the Los Altos History Museum. It's divided into four more main categories. We've got the valley, the creeks, the hills, and the town, as well as our community corner. And we're just so delighted to have this multi-million dollar project finally come to completion and to welcome the public. So come on in. Uh, welcome to Making Connections, Stories from the Land, the new permanent exhibition at the Los Altos History Museum. It is opening on February 11th and has been a long project for the museum to completely renovate our uh, top floor of the museum. And the old exhibition had been here for 20 years. And we were really excited to have an opportunity to gut the whole room. Um, everything but the train had to stay. The train, the train had to stay. <laughs> So, so the train diorama has long been a favorite part of our exhibits here at the History Museum. And it makes sense, really, that the town got its start as a number of stops along uh, the, uh, the railroad, uh, both in the north part and then down along all the corners. So we still have the uh, streetcars, and we also have the steam train that would have gone up to San Francisco. But now we've sort of augmented this with uh, some new updates. There's places where you can learn about each of the people in town and what they're doing. And you can sort of see there a little bit, we have the USS Akron in augmented reality floating over the town on its way back to its hangar in Moffett Field. So the, the point of this exhibition is to give people a really good introduction to our local environments and how the people who have lived here have influenced our landscape over time and vice versa, how the landscape has changed the people. So the exhibition is divided into four main categories. We have the valley, which represents um, our, our major area here, Valley of Hearts Delight, Silicon Valley. Um, we have the hills section, which represents not just the town of Los Altos Hills, but also a broader geographic and chronological time frame. And then we have the creeks section, which are uh, beautiful natural boundaries and are also really important to our local history. And in each section we have these timelines where people can go deeper into specific events that happened in that geography and will hopefully introduce people to great local events and local places that uh, they might not be familiar with or maybe they just learn more about them. So one of the other really exciting components of this exhibition is so many of our artifacts from the collection have been brought up and put on display. We're really excited to let the community see some of the treasures we have here at the Los Altos History Museum. Um, there are four large artifact displays and I'm standing in front of the one that goes with the valley section of the exhibition. And uh, what we have in this display case is some artifacts that relate to the, the people and the events that happened in not only Silicon Valley, but also the Valley of Hearts Delight, and even going back further in time to the Ohlone and the way they used the valley. But we think our visitors will be excited to see things they recognize, like um, 
the HP laboratories when they had their anniversary um, t-shirt that they gave out and um, another really exciting artifact that we have on display here is a manual for the Apple One that's uh, signed by uh, Steve Wozniak and uh, we have a prototype for the Klystron which helped Varian Associates um, become such a dominant company in the area. All right, and we're back. So uh, th thanks again to uh, Larry Barron for, for pulling that together on short notice. That was uh, done just in a couple of days. And um, Elizabeth, I know uh, the video doesn't do the full exhibi exhibition justice. Um, you know, we couldn't capture the, the, the depth and the breadth, but uh, I mean, it is amazing to see those huge video walls on three sides with, uh, touch screens and, you know, audio uh, listening devices. So um, maybe you can share with us a little bit more about what we just saw and we weren't able to uh, to pack into five minutes in a video. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. Yes, of course, I'm, uh, I just put in the chat link to like the, the museum's website in case you, anyone would like to hear more about our plans for the opening on, on um, Saturday. Um, the, um, the main thing I noticed in the video is I, I we didn't get a chance to talk people stories so that you saw, saw the timeline and the chance to dig into that. Um, but we also have the other screens of um, where there are listening stations where people can um, hear bio, biographical short 90 second, not anything long, but um, we have sort of 90 second profiles of various 30 different people that have lived in our area and they're they're with each each section. Um, and we also have a a big book, a kind of like a phone book style almost of, of people who have lived in the town. That's got a further, I think, 40 individuals profiled there. So there's lots of opportunities for people who are familiar with the area and, and know uh, local, you, you might very well find. It was really nice, like last night, um, there was a woman whose father was profiled in the exhibition. And um, of course, same goes for Kim, right? His father's profiled in the exhibition. And I think, um, uh, Mel Khan is is excited to hear his dad's voice. So another thing that we didn't talk about is there is a there's a globe chair. There's a chair where people can sit down and um, and hear snippets from our oral histories. And we've been collecting oral histories for 30 years. Um, and we were able to give a small sample, um, but you kind of sit down in this in this uh, you know well it's a big round thing and you sit in it and you can hear really well uh, in there. So it's got a Got, right now it's got Sammy Khan talking a little bit about starting up his pharmacy. So we plan to profile local people in that and we can change those periodically as well. So yeah, I think leveraging technology was really important to this exhibition, being able to, to know like the big video screens to make that immediate visual impact on people, but then also to utilize touch screens and um, audio and the augmented reality, all of which can be updated. So as we discover new information, as we learn things, if just we have a new event that happens or we decide, you know what, there's a person we didn't profile originally, but perhaps we should have, we can always add content and, you know, not trying to overwhelm people. So we'd probably actually be swapping it out rather than 
just continuously adding. Um, so it's it's already a uh, pretty content dense and uh, one, but that was very intentional because what we really really want to have happen is we want people to come back over and over again. Um, we found with our own per, per, our old permanent exhibition, people would go upstairs, take a look around, um, and they were like, "Okay, I get it." I get it, you know, and then they kind of absorb the content in maybe 15 minutes. Um, and other than the five-year-olds that wanted to keep pressing the button over and over again to see if the train would keep coming each time, um, for, for adults in the room, it was a it was pretty sure the train would come again. And um, so otherwise, but we think this one will really allow, you know, if you're if you have in-laws coming into town, if you have friends coming from out of town, every time you go to the exhibition, you would discover something new. Um, and that's part of the idea that our local residents would really be encouraged to use this and our local real estate agents and uh you know, any anybody who's new in town, like this would be a place you can come back to over and over again. So that was part of our intention with the with the new permanent exhibition as well. That's great. And I, I'm pretty sure I've seen a few adults uh, hit that button over and over again uh, as well. So um, if, if I could just follow up on one thing, Elizabeth, um, I know when we were uh, doing some of the video recording, you talked a little bit about place based storytelling. Um, hmm. uh, for those of us who aren't familiar with that, can you give us a quick overview of what that means exactly? Yeah, thank you so much for asking, Joe. I'm, I'm, you know, as an intellectual, as a PhD, you know, what have you, it is really nice to be able to bring that concept to the Los Altos History Museum. I'm excited, and and it was really an honor that the the entire committee was excited about trying that storytelling approach, which is. When we talk about the exhibition being novel, that's really one of the most novel features of it um, is that place-based storytelling approach. It, it is very current in, in um, academia. It's something that is getting a lot of term I made up, but it's very, it's very on trend with what's happening in the museum world and in academia. Um, and I think it's especially appropriate for a local history museum. The intention is to have, uh, so teenagers, through identity formation, right, and they're trying to understand who they are, if they have real knowledge of their own local community, why is that street named what it's named? Why is that, where does that creek start? Where does that creek end? Um, what's What has happened up in that particular home over the years? It really helps them anchor their sense of their own identity to a local place. And, and it's it's important in a, in a lot of different ways. Um, it's also really important in terms of storytelling because it uh, gives the, the visitor in this case, but also you can read novels that will use this approach. It gives the person absorbing the information what we call right? So I'm not spoon feeding the visitors a particular storyline. Anytime you're doing a chronological one, you're, you're editing, you're doing so much editing. So this format really allows the visitor to have more agency in creating their own storyline. How do I intersect with these other people in these other places? So it's meant to do two things. One is to make the story more memorable. When people leave the museum, they drive past Adobe Creek, they're going to go, oh, now I know so much more about Adobe Creek than I did before, and it's therefore more personal to them, and they'll remember it better. And then secondly, when they're in the exhibition itself, they're also feeling more empowered. And that's actually part of the goal of museums is it's part of democracy. Each and every single citizen in the United States has responsibility to know things and to act on things. And museums help activate that sense of agency and discovery. Um, and you have to be informed, right? You need to be self-informed. And museums as a self-directed learning environment um, encourage that. And this storytelling format especially encourages self-discovery. Fantastic, thank you. That's super helpful. Um... So I, I thought, Larry, um, we might be uh, able to switch gears a little bit and just talk about um, the future of the History Museum. We mentioned, uh, I think you mentioned earlier that, um, you know, it's a great example of a public-private partnership. Um, it's been going on for, for decades, you know, maybe in need of uh, revisiting and just, you know, sort of looking at better ways to uh, work together. Can you talk a little bit about um, you know how the museum operates today, and uh, we'll we'll go from there. Yeah, so th that's right. We we're you know very pr proud of how far we've come, but uh, 
what I'd say is that the museum and the community of people who care about it are, if anything, becoming more ambitious. We have, have more ideas and more plans that we want to uh, bring forward. Um, okay, I'll talk about three different directions. So, so one is in the area of education. Uh, education has been a part of the History Museum's uh, mission from the very beginning. One of the main ways that happened was that people in third and fourth grade would come and visit typically the Smith House and see some of, of uh, the artifacts there and talk about what life was like there. And, and it's great. In fact, we get adults who come visit the museum and remember when they were in third grade visiting and doing that and stuff. So we'll certainly be continuing that. But there's a lot more that we'd like to be able to do, maybe with some older grades. Uh, as an example of that, we have a, a great collection of oral histories. I'd love to be able to get those online. And maybe we could work with like high school curriculum where they could start experimenting with the uh, primary sources and, and working that sort of thing. Um, and uh, we have grants in for middle school education projects as well. So more and education, that's sort of the public private partnership then between the museum and the school districts and, and private schools as well. So that'll be a key area. Another area that I think is important to extend is, you know, one of the main things that I love about the museum is we have a lot of people who didn't grow up here. And when they arrive, how do they put down roots? Well, one of the key ways you can put down roots is understanding this environment around you, what happened here, what the people were like and so forth. And that's great. We, I think we do a good job of that. But you can't help but observe when you look around that people are arriving from other places too. We have a lot of uh, Los Altos residents that have come to us from Asia in one place or another, for example. And, and you know, in all honesty, when you look around the museum right now, we haven't done as much as we could to tell that part of the story. It's a more recent story and so forth. I'd really like to continue uh, extending that as we have um, uh, uh, in some of the exhibits as well, for example, the Juana Briones one was that I was really excited about, is how do we keep telling more and more parts of the story with more and more of the people who, who are here and perhaps new arrivals, but they have great stories too in sharing those. The last one I'll share is, is we're talking with the city about the orchard. Um, of course, Gilbert Smith himself thought of the house and orchard as a unit. Um, and we have done some programs with the orchard. Uh, but we're talking with with uh, the city about how else we could get involved with that, uh, maybe help um, steward that forward. Uh, not to be snarky, but if you look at the two history houses that the city has, uh, the Smith House and the Halsey House, uh, the Smith House has been under the stewardship of the association. The Halsey House has not, it's sort of a controlled experiment. Uh, we kind of think that it would be cool if the orchard got a little bit more of the Smith House treatment, and a little bit less of the Halsey House treatment. And exactly what that'll look like, we have to figure that all out with the city, uh, but they seem very receptive to that. And uh, I'm sure we'll be able to figure something out to help make that get better as well. So those three areas. And I'm just curious, Larry, like how, how many people are involved in the in the History Museum, like from volunteers to the staff? Like, is it is it dozens? Is it hundreds? Like, how, how big does this extend? How yeah, Elizabeth, you, you probably have the, the slightly more accurate numbers. Um, well, I think our smallest uh, and and to that public private and partnership in the the history of it is a volunteer organization. The smallest number is the staff. The staff is tiny. Um, it's uh, and it gets it's tinier by the week. No, we're we are trying to we're trying to um, add people, but it's it's tough. It's a tough hiring environment, obviously. So we have um, we have basically five people on staff um, at right now. So it's a small staff. Um, and then you volunteer wise, active volunteers that are uh, coming in, you know, we send out emails every, how many hours did you volunteer for the, for the museum this, this month? That is 120 that are sort of actively volunteering at the museum in some capacity or another um, every month. And then our membership base, uh, of course, there's lots of different ways to measure your membership, but I would put it at 500. Um, and then, you know, some, some museums double that because there's usually two people in every household. So we could say we have a thousand um, members, but we're, we're, we're definitely trying to keep ourselves. We think we, we're pretty good present uh, percentage of people in Los Alpes. We'd like to see that, of course, grow to, uh, and we, and our membership does include Palo Alto, Mountain View, Cupertino. We have people from all over the area that are members, but of course, the largest base is Los Altos residents. Got it. Great. And Larry, I, I had a question about your, your vision um, for the future of the History Museum. I think you um, covered pieces of that, but if you want to expound a little further on um, 
you know, relationship with the city or, or other ideas, um, why don't you, why don't you take a moment to do that as well? Yeah. The relationship with the city has, has been really good. Uh, you know, as I said, just met with Gabe just yesterday and, and we continue to talk about how to work things, uh, well with that. One of the things that we're kind of interested in is, is, you know, although the name is the Los Altos History Museum, when you look at the, for example, the new exhibit, it's pretty clear that the scope of the story extends well beyond the boundaries of Los Altos. And so, uh, for example, at the opening um, uh, tomorrow, we will have uh, uh, people representing uh, the hills, Los Altos Hills, uh, Mountain View. I believe uh, Supervisor Smidian will be coming in. Um, so we certainly don't limit our storytelling to the hard boundaries of Los Altos, the municipality. And so I think part of what we're interested in saying, hey, can we extend those partnerships to other places, particularly places like uh, the hills where they don't have a museum, but they have a lot of people interested in history. Could we perhaps uh, involve them more, Mountain View, um, and then collaborate with with the surrounding communities that, that are getting started? So um, it, it's a, a time of ambition at the History Museum. That's great. Thank you. Um... So I think think we're going to wrap up here in a moment and um, see if there are any questions from the audience. But um, Elizabeth, I just wanted to give you um, you know a chance for any closing thoughts or final remarks. Well, I definitely just want to extend an invitation to everyone to come uh, tomorrow to the opening event and and or of course anytime you want to come but tomorrow is going to be special we are having as as larry mentioned uh, the official comments um and we we have the muwekma tribal uh leadership is coming and they they've been teaching their young people how to dance some traditional dances um and as you can well imagine i mean the Indigenous population is not like this continuous, right? It's been very, lots of challenges to them and to their identity and to their sense of place and continuity. So they're they're relearning dances from other tribes and it's just nice to be supportive of their efforts um, to give some sense of um, tradition to their young people. So they're going to be dancing um, for us and that's, that's from 11 to noon before the ribbon cutting. And then afternoon, we have partnered with an organization to Larry's point about trying to be sort of throughout Santa Clara County. We've partnered with an organization called Mosaic America and Mosaic America definitely pulls from Southeast Asian traditions, Hispanic traditions, um, you know, Celtic traditions, like very, very innovative in the way they combine artistic traditions from throughout the world. So they are doing a series of programs for us um, in half an hour chunks all afternoon with breaks in between. So people can go see the exhibit, sit in the courtyard and see some amazing artistic presentations of music and dance and uh, like Thai, uh, tai Chi or, you know, movement, and uh, it's going to be really beautiful. So I think part of the permanent exhibition is really to show uh, that our community has always been diverse, and we don't expect that to stop anytime soon, um, and that we welcome it. We, we appreciate the kinds of synergies and new ideas that come from dialogue. So uh, Mosaic America has been uh, put together a really nice program in the afternoon. So definitely it's free, and uh, I hope I hope you all will, will come by. Great, thank you. And um, Larry, any um, any final thoughts before we move on to uh, questions? I'll just point out that the same day that we're opening the History Museum is also the Lava Valentine Choco Stroll, so that you can get some history and get some chocolate. And what's better than a day like that? So, wow, Scott must have paid you well for that. Uh, that you promised I could have some chocolate. Yeah, thank you. All right, perfect. Um, well, thank thank you both so much. Um, why don't we? Uh, open it up for questions. Um, if anybody has a question, please raise your hand. Uh, I think you know the drill about one question per person, um, no speeches, et cetera. <laughs> so why don't we start with our Los Alton of the year, Mr. Gary Hedden. Take it away, Gary. Well, thank you, Joe. And also past president at the History Museum. Uh, my question is, uh, Elizabeth, you mentioned uh, changing the content, updating the content. Uh, is there going to be a regular uh, plan to do that? Uh, do you have a vision of how often and how large that kind of rollout of new ideas would, would be uh, taking place? And I wondered also if that might be connected uh, with the changing exhibit, which is also opening tomorrow, a, a new, new show down there. And 
while, I, while I've got the floor. Don't forget, we do have the outdoor exhibit, uh, the P Pathways, uh, Wallace Stegner, uh, A Path to Conservation. And that's been very popular while we were closed. People could have our outdoor exhibit to, to look at. That's still open. Anyway, sorry, that's a long question, but uh, something about the okay, content okay. changes that might be taking place. Changes might be no, taking thank you, place. Gary. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about that. I, so, I, and I mentioned that many museums have this sort of permanent exhibition gallery, changing exhibition galleries, and coming up with a strategy for how to manage that content um, and how to keep it fresh on a regular basis without. Um, you know, uh, you guys here, I think many of you are savvy in, in terms of, you know, PR and how often can you make changes? People have one idea in mind and then the place is totally different than they expected. And so the lifeline, life expectancy of, of uh, PR messaging and, and how, how quickly can you change? So that's one challenge of our various spaces. So we have the Jay Gilbert Smith House. We have a changing exhibition gallery in the Jay Gilbert Smith House. We have a permanent exhibition outdoors. We have the cap capacity to do changing exhibitions outdoors. Um, and then we have the permanent exhibition inside and a changing exhibition gallery below that. Um, and so, yeah, there's a lot of spaces to be activating. And, and I think one one factor is um, the new permanent exhibition is uh, pegged a little bit higher in terms of reading level and content. We expect it's sort of, it, it's it's sweet zone is maybe eighth grade, um, you know, so that it's, and that our old permanent exhibition sweet zone was probably second grade. So this is, this has a, a definitely, it's still kid friendly. There's still stuff for kids to do, but we, with the, the kind of, hey, this is meant for me, we think starts um, a little bit older on this one. And, and that's good because it's a little more like the saddle. There weren't a lot of adults that wanted to sit on the saddle, right? So um, I, though I do have a picture of Gary doing that one time. So, you know, <laughs> it sometimes happened, but usually people read the old room as very kid centric. It was just, everything was at that sort of kid level and they won't read this one as sort of kid centric. It's gonna feel more open to a broader range of ages, which gives us, the opportunity to do something more kid centric, either outdoors in our changing exhibition gallery in the Jay Gilbert Smith house. Like we definitely know that our bread and butter is about families, and we do want young kids to feel welcome at the museum. So I think it will change some of the strategies that we use in our other changing exhibition spaces to ensure that um, the, the loyalty we've engendered with our continues to like keep, keep people coming back for our changing exhibits, which I, I think will be great actually to have more kid friendly um, offerings in our in our changing exhibition gallery. So I think it's a uh, but your first question often we'd be updating upstairs and um, you know, there's, of course, there's just the edits from like what we rolled out that we're finding little typos and things we don't, weren't quite what we expected from what we first rolled out. But after that, we're expecting probably on every six months, we'd be trying to change the artifacts in the community dis corner. And, um, you know, of course, we had the same ambitions with the old permanent exhibition that we'd be changing it every, every so often. And so that those can sometimes fall by the way, if I, but I, uh, position which specifically is in charge of keeping the content fresh for the permanent exhibition. So I, I don't think we'd be doing a major overhaul of the organization. I would hope this will last at least five years with its organizational schema as is, but there's always room for tweaks. All right. I think um, Mark uh, has a question. Go ahead, Mark. I do. Elizabeth and Larry, how can I become a member of the History Museum? <laughs> Excellent. You can go to our website, losaltashistory.org, and you'll see there's a place there to um, join at various membership levels. Uh, the event last night was, in fact, a preview event for our uh, supporting members, so it was it was a lot of fun to welcome them in first. But uh, and please, I, I, by all means, I would encourage you. We, we have a bit of a conundrum with the membership, just to be clear about it, right? The normal dynamic around museums is that they charge a bunch of money to get in and then they say well you can be a member and get in free but really it's sort of a, a way of charging a bit more um ours is free and we want to keep it free we want to make it so that people can come that they can bring uh things or the kids can come in if they want to whatever we want to keep the admission free so there's not that reason 
But there is an important reason, which is that the membership is uh, uh, financially supports the museum, of course. So thank you for asking. And we appreciate that when people join that way, we do have fun barbecues and stuff. So you get invited to stuff like that. Um, and, and just so you know that one other re reason to to uh, join and, and definitely we encourage you to join and encourage others to join, which is that when we apply for grants or when we go to hire people, one of the questions that they often ask is how many members do you have? Right. And and they ask that for a very logical reason. Right. You can imagine I'm thinking about joining as a staff member. I want to know whether this institution enjoys broad support and engagement. And so so those kind of questions from grant granting organizations or from employees or anything like that, those are important. And so it is an area we're putting more attention to is what we can do to encourage people to join, to indicate their support for the museum and so that we can we can share with people because I, I I know I, I'm sure sure because I've talked to a bunch of people who come and visit and enjoy it and definitely feel a sense of ownership as Los Altos of this great resource, but just never quite get around to to filling it out. But please go to the website and uh, uh, join up. The entry level is quite affordable, and uh, you can go beyond that if you're feeling extra magnanimous. If you have any extra Bitcoin, send it to Larry. He'll take care <laughs> Quick, of it before it's there. worthless. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Scott, you have a question. Go ahead. Uh, sure. Thanks, Joe. And, and thanks for the plug, Larry. The check's in the mail. Um, <laughs> wanted to ask uh, who and how how are things curated for this? Uh, you know, Elizabeth, you, you mentioned the collection, and I've been down in the vault, and I know that there's a lot more than what's out, out on the shelves. Uh, certainly that allows for some changeover and, you know, new things being added. But how was it originally curated and the thoughts behind it? Who, who did that? Okay, um, great. Thank you. Well, the so I, um, I I just had the opportunity. My old boss at the Smithsonian, he's he had his 80th birthday, and we did a fesh script for him. And I was able to write in the fesh script a bit of a thank you for the the type of exhibition that he was was really. He, I, I think he's one of the very earliest ones who had a very collaborative sense of of curating. So some curators will be like they want to be the absolute expert on. They will spend years getting to know it. They will create an exhibition that is just displaying their own personal knowledge. Um, and that's the traditional kind of curatorial model. Um, the, the curatorial model I was trained on is very collaborative based and setting up sort of teams of people that know areas, letting those teams work together to, to bubble up content. Um, and then the curator's role is to kind of pull it all together under a structure that makes sense for the visitor to do some editing perhaps, but to really allow for different voices to come through. Um, and so in this case, I, um, you know, they said, we're doing this permanent exhibition and you curator Elizabeth. And I immediately turned around and said, okay, I want a team for the Valley, a team for the town, a team for the creeks, a team for the hills. Um, and I was the curator of the Hills team. So I turned around and invited a bunch of residents from the Hills to come join me. Of, of Kim was one of them. And we met on a, you know, for, for about six months, it was pretty regular. We were meeting and we were brainstorming. We were going through different ways of, of approaching it. I was trying to pull out themes that were really important to residents of the Hills. Um, and, uh, and then we also had a diversity advisory group that came in and those were historians from around Santa Clara Valley that were particular experts in um, uh, the Japanese American experience, the Japanese immigrant experience, the Hispanic traditions in the area. We had an Ohlone expert that was working with us. So trying to pull together those various streams of local. And of course, like for the town section, we had great input from um, town leaders. Jane Reed was the curator of that section. And um, but I do think that our collections is like this was a wonderful opportunity because we all started using the data, the database of everything in our collection. And you'd put in a search term and oh, my gosh, I didn't even know oral history talking about the floods from Adobe Creek. Like, wow. And that was great. And um, oh, I just got a message that my Internet is unstable. Uh, sorry. And we also had a chance to collaborate with the Mountain View Historical Association with the Hill. So it was it was definitely a team effort. We had the part night was a lot of people who won the exhibition and standing capacity just to count for all the people that sort of helped make it happen. So that's the cure we used. And we expect now that we know, oh, you know, we'll we'll keep going deeper and as we discover new things, um, bring them to the fore. So thank you, Scott. 
Yeah, I think I think your internet has been in and out throughout. So hopefully, uh, hopefully, it uh, recovers here. Um, we have two more uh, questions. Marie, go ahead. Uh, just a, a simple logistical question about tomorrow. Will there be food for sale? I'm coming um, with people that will need lunch. And so we can either, you know, get that somewhere else or get it at the museum. Our, our um, hospitality committee was not tasked with coming up with lunch for people. And we have used like Tal Palo in the past to do food on the site, but no, we are going to encourage people to go downtown to get their food. Um, and, uh, and then, yeah, no, that we don't, we, the performances are going to take up a lot of the space in our courtyard. So not, not this time, Marie, thank you for asking though. Chocolate for lunch then, I guess. <laughs> Yay. All right. Uh, Kim, go ahead. Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for the uh, all the great stuff you do for the community. <clears throat> really looking forward to the opening tomorrow. Um, I think the uh, History Museum is a great example of a public-private partnership, as has already been mentioned. And for uh, others who are on this Zoom and for others who will see the video uh, of this uh, online. I'm real curious, uh, I'm not sure who best to direct this to, maybe starting with Larry. Um, in terms of public-private partnership, uh, what do you think has really worked uh, to make the public-private partnership between uh, the museum and the city? And, and uh, you're looking at partnerships with schools too. What's made them really work well? Uh, what could work better? And what lessons have you learned? Um, well, first of all, I, I have to say that I think it's a collaboration that's working very well. I think it has for a long time. And I, I think uh, uh, Gabe and his staff are immensely supportive and, and value the way this works. And, and just a big shout out to them for just being so, so, uh, so helpful and so forth. I think, I think a, a key thing with it is uh, that it has to start with a core of people who are passionate and committed to trying to make the thing happen, right? Is that that what really makes this all work is the fact that there's a group of people, um, you know, my, my wife might say to a nutty degree or whatever, but like <laughs> are really excited about this sort of thing and making it work. Um, and then what the private part public partnership allows you to do is harness that energy um, to help create something for the community based on sort of a foundation that the city itself can put in place. Right. And, and so it's, it's been a, a really great way to do that. But I do think that that's key. But the, the reason it kind of ends up working is because um, that group of people who are excited about things can organize in various ways. A key thing is that 501c3, it becomes very easy for them to accept donations in a way that the city is just not set up to do as well. Probably at least as importantly as when they do donate, they can then get involved in various ways. They can become members. If they're really serious, they can become board members and things like that. Um, chair committees and things like that. And so that they get to direct the donations they make of money, also the donations they make of time and collaborate to make the vision come together in a way, you know, I, I'm also very active in the historical commission and I think it does great work, but everything we want to do in that kind of venue has to be agendized, brown act. We can't even talk among ourselves until we do that. That just doesn't lend itself to a pace of decision-making Right? Can you imagine having tried to do this permanent exhibit where every meeting we had to discuss the exhibit contact, we had to do Brown Act agendizing and so forth. It would have just been impossible, too cumbersome, right? So so um, I think it's it's a good example, you know, but I do think that the key there is there has to be a, a group of people who have a sort of vision of a cool thing that they could do in their community and that they want to mobilize their time and their talent and their treasure to make that vision come true. And then the city can provide the, the sort of platform to help make that happen. So it's a great thing. And I will say if anybody has other ideas about that, one of the things that I myself and I'm sure others in the museum community would do would be happy to dig into that in more detail, talk about what's worked, talk about how we've solved problems that have arisen along the way and so forth. But but it's 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 really a great structure for, for making something like that happen for the community. Thanks, Larry. All right. Well. I see no other hands, so I think we're going to wrap now on time. Um, just a few quick announcements. Um, our next meeting will be on Friday, February 24th from 8.30 to 9.30. Uh, please join us for a panel discussion entitled Los Altos Downtown Vision Plan Update with Anthony Carnesecca and Nick Zorns. 
Uh, should be a great discussion. For those um, who aren't aware, there's actually a study session on Tuesday the 14th at 5.30, which is around the uh, downtown vision plan. So if you want to get your uh, downtown vision plan uh, you know, in, you have uh, multiple opportunities coming up in the next couple of weeks. If you would uh, like to be added to the LACC mailing list, uh, you can email us uh, info at losaltoscommunitycoalition.org. Uh, Kim just put the uh, address in the chat as well. And uh, thank you as always to the Los Altos Mountain View Community Foundation for providing us with financial and in-kind support. And uh, once again, thank you, Larry Barron, for uh, all you do to uh, to support the videos and the YouTube channel. So um, let's uh, let's uh, join in uh, some air clapping for uh, Larry and Elizabeth for a great program. Best of luck to you uh, tomorrow as you, you. Uh, as you open up to the public. And uh, we'll look forward to seeing everyone in a few weeks. Thanks so much. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.